for your your study um, you mentioned 64 grams is that net or is that total that's my first question the second question is um, how strict is the Board of Medicine in South Africa with regards <laughs> to doctors not following the guidelines I'm, I'm, I'm going to be concerned that here in the United States that so far we don't have a NOKES V 2.0. So. Okay. Is this on? Are we, are we on there then? Okay. So the carbohydrate was total carbohydrate, and we measured a mean of 15 grams of fiber. So I guess it's a 50 gram net carbohydrate. Yeah. And then I think the HPCSA is kind of testing the water with Tim Noakes. So I don't know of any other action against a doctor for following low carb or for giving that advice. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I know that the medical profession is watching quite closely. You know, is that, yeah. Um, my questions, for, questions are for Chris, clarifying questions. Um, number one, you mentioned hunger a bunch of times and I'm assuming that people felt that they had control of their hunger rather than that they felt like they were hungry. Is that correct? That's, that's right. Yeah, sorry for not being clear about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah they were in control of hunger. Okay, and um, in terms, so it sounds like the women had more complaints about lack of weight loss than the men did, is that yeah. correct? Okay, and um, what about the other benefits in women? That, so particularly those women that didn't lose as much weight, did they have some of those other benefits just no. as much as the other groups or a lot less? So in terms of the women who, there were I think two who were upset about the weight loss the rest were very happy with all the other benefits they'd received and there were there was one at least one case of a pregnancy after giving up that sort of thing and yeah they were they were very much um a lot some of the some of the women actually said it's the first time that their weight loss had stalled and that they hadn't given up on on their diet so they were so happy with it that they were even okay at at you know, they lost 5% or whatever, weight loss stalled, and they were going to stick, stick with it because of how good they felt. And their markers, were there, were there markers in the mean, or were they low as well? No, they, so there, there was no real, we couldn't find any sort of association between, um, between weight loss and, so, so let me just, yeah, um, I'm trying to understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yeah, there was no, there's no clear link between markers and success on the, on the diet that we could really find from this. But I think it's such a small, the, it's such a um, homogenous group that we, it's not easy to look for that sort of thing. In the last one, the, um, the ones who had the highest carb, carb consumption, yeah. were they the ones that had the lowest weight loss? Was there any association there? No, not at all. There were some, some of the higher ones were the ones I showed with the remission there. And there was no, no association in this group with weight loss and carbohydrate consumption. And I think maybe that would come through if we had a much larger group. And because it's such a, it is a small window, it's still only, it's still 40 or 40 grams to 100 grams. It's a very small range. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. A question for Chris. Um, we hope that Professor Noakes lives forever. But I wonder, are you going to be the next Professor Noakes? <laughs> well, that would be nice, but I think Professor Noakes, such huge shoes, right? Absolutely. <laughs> His running shoes. Just start tweeting. Yeah, and <laughs> do, you know. the other question is, um, can you tell the, share with the audience where you're headed with the research? I know we had talked about okay. that. Yeah, so what, what we're doing is we are setting up a, a randomized control trial. And our, it's very mechanistic focus, so we're looking at mitochondrial respiration, which has been mentioned a lot here, gut microbiome, um, liver gluconeogenesis, and there's one more, but I can't remember. Oh, uh, cardiac risk. <laughs> Sorry. We might, yeah, we might. Yeah. Oh. Uh, my question's for Amber. Um, I, w I was a vegetarian for two years and gave it up when I walked into a restaurant one day and 
they'd spray paint it on the salad bar plant killer. But uh, I'm, <laughs> seriously, I want to know why you gave up plants. Was it uh, was there research? Are you experimenting? Personal? I mean, are they trying to kill you? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a possible mechanism for why it helped me. But the the reason that I started. I, as I said at the beginning, or, or as Rod said, I'd been on a low-carb diet for a long time, and I was very successful in the beginning, but for a variety of reasons, or the, I don't really know the reason, but uh, age and uh, multiple pregnancies, I had gained a lot of weight even while on a low-carb diet. And so I was at a point where I felt very uh, frustrated and desperate, and I had heard of some people that were eating an all-meat diet, and I thought, well, I could try that out for a period and maybe that would get me the weight loss I wanted and then I would continue to maintain on a regular garden variety low carb diet. And then what happened was within about two weeks of trying this all meat diet, my adulthood long bipolar disorder went into remission quite obviously to me. And so that was why I have stayed with it for all these years. Okay, um, two things, <clears throat> two questions. Um, first of all, this is a bit of an unusual situation because I am one of those 29 people. So if anybody has any questions about the real, <laughs> you know, what do we really think, ask me. Ask me. Um, I'd, li I'd like to just make a couple of points really about that study and, and also how, how that kind of impacted me. I um, was diagnosed in August 2014 and I went into the doctor and I was given a quote I was told my, I think my HbA1c was 10.3. It's either 10.3 or 9.2, I can't remember which one now. And the doctor said, come back on Friday, and we'll put you on drugs. Um, and, and that was the only thing he said. You know, he, he said, you know, well, you're overweight, obviously, now you've got diabetes, put you on drugs, start on Friday. Anyway, I went home, and that evening, I was Googling, and I came across one research paper, and that one research paper said, it, was some, it said something around, the, the wording was the, the, the effects of a low carbohydrate hydrate diet on a severe diabetic. And there were something like 28 people in the study, and, they, the, and the study had lots of blurb, as, as you would expect, um, and it had a chart. And in the chart, it showed 28 people with their HbA1c changing. And two of them had gone up, one of them had gone down dramatically, and the other 27 had gone down quite a bit. And then when you read the story, the, the, the actual discussion said two people gave up and they said one person ignored the instruction. And the instruction was eat a 30% or less carbohydrate diet. Um, this woman had gone off and she'd done a 10% carbohydrate diet. And they also said, and she ignored our instructions to exercise, she actually went out and walked for half an hour a day. And I thought, well, so that, I can do that. So that day, I started that diet. Now, on the day that I started, which was on the Monday, my fasting glucose was 18.4. On the Friday, when I went back to get my tests to be started on these drugs, it was 9.4. And in the intervening period, I just stopped eating carbohydrates. Over the course of that next six months, my HbA1c, I, I, I don't know exactly what the numbers were. I think it was about six and a half at the six-month level, which is when uh, I first got in touch with you guys. I think it is now about five and a half, and I have stuck to under 30 grams of carbs. I lost um, about 25 kilograms in the course of about six to eight months by actually sticking to under 30 grams of carbs, 15 to 20 percent proteins, the balance being fats. At one point, uh, halfway through, I went back to my doctor and my HDL wasn't going up, but everything else was moving in the right direction. I deliberately went out and got some extra butter <laughs> and started eating butter, at which point my saturated fat, uh, the, the HDL, my HDL has now gone up by 60% from 1 to 1.6. My triggers have come down by 70% by doing this. My LDL, as it happens, is one of the ones that went down a little bit. So. I'm currently hoping eventually I'm going to get to be one of these hyper-responders. I think that's probably a good place <laughs> to be. Um, but but yeah, it, it, the other thing I did was I took all of my blood tests, all 41 markers, and I measured, I'm an accountant by background, I measured these at the start, six months in, 12 months in, all 41 markers all got better. 
Everything moved in the right range. It didn't matter which particular thing I was looking at, they were all the right thing. Now since then, I have carried on with that diet. I no longer have any sense of having to eat. You know, I, it is true that now and again, I, you know, I have a blowout, but my blowout is, you know, it lasts for an evening. And for example, a couple of days ago, um, my colleague and I, we, we went for a, a sirloin steak. Big surprise. We had the sirloin steak, I had um, some buttered greens with it. I had a completely flat line result. Following day, I thought, well, I'll just play about a little bit. And not only did I have the sirloin steak, I had a few onion rings and half of his sweet. I then spent the next 24 hours, everything being a good um, two moles higher, with a much bigger spec, everything that just says, actually, just don't do that. Now, one of the things that I, I would say on all this is that when you are all looking at how to get people onto this, if you do take them onto diabetes.co.uk website, what you will find is there are dozens of people like me who've done it within the first six months. When people first go onto that website, they come in with HbA and C's numbers that are terrible, and they get the exact same advice every time, which is, number one, buy a blood glucose monitor. Forget whether, if you're not getting it from your health provider, just tell them to do it anyway. Tell them to do a blood glucose monitor and then check your blood glucose two hours after you've eaten. If your numbers have gone up by more than two moles, stop doing whatever you did. And when people do that, the numbers come down everywhere. Everybody sees it. There are a thousand plus people who've done it and they all report massive drops in, in uh, weight. They, there's a huge amount of enthusiasm on that site for people to actually show it. And I'm kind of one of the people that now helps other people to get that done. So, you know, it, it's just so important that you realize that if you give people the control by telling them to get the monitor, do it themselves, it doesn't cost that much to start testing your own blood. But when you do that, you do follow it and you do, do, do what I did. There are hundreds of people doing just that. So I just wanted to, if anybody has any questions, because I'm, I'm kind of one of those people. What I did was 60% protein, 60% fat, 20% ish carb, 20% ish protein on about 1300 calories because I was on a diet, I was trying to lose weight, which is what, what happened. Included in that was 5% whiskey. I've never drunk whiskey before in my life. I have never drunk alcohol until I did this. And then I thought, you know what? Let's just go for everything. I'm gonna change my life because I'd spent 20 years being told the way to get slim was to eat low fat food, to do all this stuff and none of it worked. And the other thing I, I would say, which I think is something that you guys need to explore, is that one of the big things that changed for me was low fat skimmed milk. I have discovered that whenever I drink skimmed milk, my appetite shoots up. And actually in the last two months or so, because everything's under control now, and because I've spent 40 years being really bothered about only eating low fat food, I became addicted to skimmed milk in my tea. And I decided I'd put it back a month ago because it's such a, you know, I'm losing out so much on my joy of life of eating low, low fat skim milk. <laughs> I've done it and I put five kilos back on again. It hasn't put my um, HbA1c still under control, all the rest of it, but I found it much, much more difficult to actually control my appetite. And that's the only thing I've changed. Great, mm. thanks. Great story. That's really good. No, I, I, Look, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, I just we'll, have one, we'll one question, on. just one question, oh, okay. which is a very quick one, uh, and this is to Amber. Do, do, you, do you actually um, have any issues, do you have any information about your lipid profile? What happens to lipids when you're... I don't have a recent one. My most recent one was 2013, and I think it looks kind of typical for a ketogenic dieter, although I'm planning to do a lot more. I've been very inspired by Dave Feldman to do a lot more measurement. <laughs> Hi, a, a comment and a, a question for, for Amber. I mean, it's interesting that you say it's, the ketogenic diet effectively mimics a brain growth diet. And I think, do, don't you agree that that makes it quite ironic when you consider what Tim Noakes was persecuted for? Because he, he suggested that maybe eating foods that promote grain, brain growth for our species to a mother is somehow um, problematic. Um, uh, whereas if you, he would have suggested that they eat cereals and other things that do not provide as useful substrates for brain growth, that wouldn't have been problematic. 
it seems that we are particularly feared of suggesting lower carb, high fat diets for children. Uh, they're, they're, and I've seen this amongst my peers and so on. They say, well, of, of course our children have to have cereal in the morning or whatever, as, as if it's a given. Uh, do, do, you, do you see the, the irony here and how, how would you deal with it in a societal way? Because yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's a very ingrained, if you don't mind the pun. It, it's very ironic. Um, for one thing, I think a lot of the objection to putting an infant or a child on a low-carb diet is the, the actual fear of ketosis. Wouldn't ketosis be bad for them? Not realizing that infants who are breastfed are in ketosis and that as the graph showed that children who the children are in ketosis between meals or overnight in a way that adults aren't. Um, on the other hand, um, there's some hope because even if they're on a high carb diet, at least they're going overnight without eating and so you can't prevent it entirely. Uh, so their best efforts are still thwarted, their brains still somehow manage to grow. <laughs> Hello Amber, this question is for you. Uh, your talk was amazing. I think you've taken the ketogenic knowledge base like to a higher level. So thank you. Um, my question is, could you explain a little bit that pathway or the comment you said about ketones are actually contributing to making cholesterol? Sure, thank you very much. Um, ketone bodies go through the blood-brain barrier very easily and we have limited ability to pass fatty acids through the blood-brain barrier. And so um, since our brains are made out of cholesterol and fat, it, it's been shown that that, that is the process that's typically used. If you don't have ketones, all is not lost because glucose can be used as the backbone for those substrates as well. But just uh, empirically, it seems that ketones are what is being used to build those structures. In that same body of information, is there a information about how long the ketones last in the brain? And then could you cite that? Uh whatever the study or where that information came from, because it's so I don't have the reference in my head, but okay. I, it, I can pass it along to the conference. And I'm not sure what you mean by how long they last, how long ketone bodies last like, in the brain. So, you know, if a whole bunch come in, let's say just 100x, you know, mm -hmm. does the brain use all 100x in 20 minutes, an hour, that do some hang know. out, you know. The rate of the metabolic process, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's really interesting. Hello. Hi. This is message for Amber. Thank you very much for your talk, Amber. I, I found it utterly, completely fascinating. And one of the things I found most fascinating was to talk about why is it that human beings, you know, can switch back and forth between glucose and ketone metabolism. And, you know, one of the theories that I've seen out there, um, you know, one time I saw this one book that this guy wrote. He, he was a really incredible science writer. and it wasn't about ketones, but it was about evolution. And what he did was he studied the nervous system and how it evolved over millions and millions of years and that it becomes progressively complex. And so there was some sort of thing going on on the planet Earth where the nervous system gives evolutionary advantages. The more complex your nervous system is, the more um, you thrive or whatever. And that had something to do with like the different types of you know, uh, primates that, that that's thrived on this planet. And one of the things that makes us different, like you mentioned, you know, is this metabolic flexibility. And so one of the theories is, is that it allows uh, the human being to go into different places on the planet, like temperate, you know, I mean, we, we evolved on the, you know, near the equator, right? But uh, there's human beings on every continent on Earth, except for Antarctica, essentially. And it's because, you know, and one of the theories is, is that because of this metabolic flexibility that you can switch back and forth, you know, to a glucose metabolism or to a ketone metabolism, and that it has a whole lot to do with that. And it has, it has everything to do with the nervous system and the complexity of it, everything to do with the brain size, you know. And so I think that that could have a whole lot to do with it. There's some interesting articles in PubMed that you can look at about metabolic, metabolic flexibility and, and uh, and evolution, you know, that are quite interesting. Um, so I would just wanted to mention that. And that one article that you mentioned, I didn't quite get the reference. Is that the one you were just talking about where it's the fed state, ver you know, the ketone state versus the glucose state? Is that the one that you were talking about or is that a different one? 
Well, I did mention, I did have uh, one of my slides was from a very recent publication in which they were using the term ketone and glucose and talking about the importance of getting into both phases. Right. Which um, article was that? Do you remember? Are you going to send it to us or something? Or? <laughs> the reference is right on the slide. And okay. I think you're getting okay. It's right on the slides. slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, okay. I have seen some interesting uh, data about different uh, cultures in, in the modern context where, yes, uh, the closer you get to the equator, the more carbohydrates there are in the diet and the, uh -huh. and the variation, which is very interesting. I do think, though, that we must have gone through ice age periods where the, the availability of carbohydrate was just a lot less than it is now. And even if those, even if it wasn't the whole lifespan or right. even the whole year, you, you've got to imagine that at least, at least for many months during the year, and at least often, this must have been the case. Well, what's really interesting is these ice ages some last, sometimes last fifty thousand years and stuff, and so it can really affect the whole gene pool. You know, for people that survive, if they have more metaphoric, metabolic flexibility, that kind of thing. There is one other thing I was going to ask you is. Are you familiar with the work of Mark Matson? He's the director of NIH Aging. He talks a lot about things that you would probably be interested in. Uh, and it's, I had mentioned this to Dr. Ede also. He talks about plant hormesis, plant foods and hormesis. Have you looked at that? or? I'm not sure I'm, I'm familiar with his work specifically, but uh -huh. I, I do know about hormesis. One of the interesting things about hormesis, hormesis is the idea that the, the toxins that are in plants are of benefit to us because ingesting a little bit of those toxins, plants are full of toxins, of course, because they, they don't want to be eaten. Right, <laughs> and it's right. a, uh, but the body response to that is an antioxidant response and that the response is beneficial to us and therefore sometimes ingesting some toxins mm -hmm. is an overall win. Right. Um, there could be something to that, um, but I don't think it justifies the kinds of quantities that were recommended right. for eating plants. Right. And, and the other thing about that is that the pathway is the same uh, f it for the effect of smoking. <laughs> so you could use the same argument to justify a little bit of smoking. Right. And right. then finally, um, the antioxidant effect of a ketogenic diet endogenously is so strong in and of itself that I'm not sure that you'd adding a little bit of plant material on top of that would really provide a, a lot of extra benefit. But it's certainly an interesting idea to continue to yeah, explore. He, he, his work is interesting. I mean, he wrote a whole book on hermesis, and he's written some current articles on it. And the other thing that he talks about, which is very similar, and he uses the same kind of language, is that fasting and exercise put kind of certain, if you do a little bit of exercise, it's really good for you. If you overdo, it's bad for you. Same thing with fasting. It, it promotes, you know, this stress, a, a certain amount of stress will promote health. And he's talking about the same thing. And I find his work interesting. Anyway, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Question for Amber. Um, the narrative that fiber is super important for your gut microbiome and things like that, and just your advice on reconciling that with an all-meat diet. So, I'm sorry, did you ask about the narrative about fiber and the gut microbiome in particular? Yes. Well, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, our, our gut microbiome is obviously very important. Um, there are a variety of different arguments about why we would need fiber to support our gut microbiome. One of them is that we need this, the short-chain fatty acid butyrate. And it, it turns out that butyrate can be made actually um, without any plant fiber at all, just from uh, animal amino acids. So if you look at um, carnivores in the wild, for example, they also make butyrate and their colons are in, in they don't have any extra damage to their colons. Um, another, I, another relevant thing for that conversation is that a lot of the bacteria in the microbiome that people are finding useful, um, the kind of probiotics, is to grow strains of bacteria that are used to cope with the plant matter that's in your diet. If you take away the plant matter, then you might not need that extra bacterial support to digest it. 
Um, people talk about the traditional use of fermented foods and argue that, that the role of those fermented foods in the diet was to provide probiotics, but another explanation for the same phenomenon is that because we gave up so much of our colons, we now, ha if we're going to eat those plants, we had to outsource that fermentation. And so fermenting those plants gets rid of a lot of the toxins. Um, we don't have to have, we don't have to house that microbiome inside, we can have it on the outside. Thank you. Uh, this question, actually I've got two questions for Amber. Um, first, as I understand you're in an all meat diet, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, would you let us know um, how you manage to work with what must be the terrible amount of scurvy that you are suffering from, <laughs> lack of vitamin C? The, the second question is, as I understand you also have raw meat that you eat as well, right? Sometimes. So could you let us know how many hospital visits you've made from the E. coli <laughs> that clearly you would have to have suffered by now? Such an agitator. <laughs> <laughs> well, even explorers over 100 years ago knew that fresh meat was a cure for scurvy because unlike the, the reports from the USDA database where they actually report that there are zero vitamin C in meat, uh, they actually, if you look at the fine print, it says they didn't measure it, they assumed it was zero. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a little bit problematic, and yeah, my, my gums aren't falling apart. Um, the other question about foodborne illnesses, there, w if you look at the CDC data, you're, you're almost as likely to suffer from a foodborne illness from raw salad or, or produce. Uh, so whenever somebody looks at my raw ground be beef meal that I might have and asks how could I possibly do that, I ask them how could they could possibly be eating spinach or strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Amber, I have a question um, about the neurocognitive benefits um, and if there's been any studies on that. Um, to see, just are you, can you think more clearly? Do you know can you if there's think been any? You know, it's funny. I think in medicine we have um, this bias where we're not really allowed to study um, optimizing health from a point of health. We're only allowed to try to intervene with disease. So we have some studies on how to improve what on improved cognition in, for example, Alzheimer's, but. I would love to see studies where you just take the baseline healthy people and compare it to see if you get better cognition. I know that anecdotally, a lot of people say, wow, the mental clarity that comes with a ketogenic diet is unsurpassed. But I don't, I don't think we've quantified that at all. If anybody else knows of a study like that, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, for Chris, uh, you mentioned multiple times this concept of control. Uh, on the part of the participants. And I was just curious uh, if you were specifically looking for the psychology behind why people wanted to participate or just elaborate on, on that observation. Okay. So this was a qualitative, qualitative study. So we didn't really know what we were looking for when we went into it. And so the way we have our interviews, which we transcribed, and then we went through the interviews looking for themes that emerged, and then you code for themes. So this was just a theme that emerged from the interviews, and we weren't really aware of it. We weren't really aware that it would be there when we started the process. So it's just something that came through very strongly that most of the participants mentioned, either control of their condition, the di diabetes, or in particular control of eating behaviors and food. Yeah. Well, I think we're, uh, we're up to break time. Um, a round of applause for two great uh, presentations.